Dante and Virgil have left the gate of repentance behind them, and after a precipitous climb, they arrive at the level of the proud. The first thing they notice is that the rock face is carved with instances of humility. First, the angel holding in his hand a lily that symbolizes the sinless purity of the Virgin makes the Annunciation. Mary's humility is in her reply, Ecce Ancilla Domini. In me, O God, behold your slave to do with as you will. Next, we see the Ark of the Covenant being taken in an ox cart to Jerusalem. King David will set aside his royal dignity to dance before this advancing Ark with humble joy. Lastly, we see suggested Emperor Trajan among his troops. You can sort of make him out standing in his chariot, the soldiers around him holding up their standards. Trajan will set aside his military responsibilities to first render justice to a poor widow. While Dante is still entranced by the images, Virgil directs his attention to a group of persons approaching from behind, carrying great stones that bend them forcibly down into the groveling posture of the humble. Here Dante speaks with several of the punished proud but Brito conveys the general idea rather than the specific identities, and, given the scale, this was the only practical solution. Then the poets speed on to where they find the pavement is engraved with images of pride punished. Dante bends down to examine the image of a prostrate demon. This is the great exemplar of arrogance reproved, the fall of Lucifer. Dante makes a great point of how these bas-reliefs, sculpted by the hand of God, seem to be real. Who's the brush and who's the pen that drew those outlines, shaded in those shapes? Who's that mastery that had to leave gasping the subtlest human skill? The pictured dead seemed really deceased, the imaged living lived. One looking on the real events would have seen less, and that less clearly than I did then, of all I walked across, bent and peering. Thus the representation of the figures in three dimensions is a careful and mandated rendering of the poem. Next we see Briareus, monstrous son of Uranus and Gaia, primordial earth and sky, who rebelled against the reign of the Olympian gods. Briareus is transfixed by a javelin thrown by one of the legitimate deities. Next we have Nimrod, builder of the Tower of Babel, whose smitten bricks are laid out on the ground to the left of his doubled-over form. Finally, there is Niobe, who boasted her fourteen children surpassed Latona's two, Apollo and Diana. Those two bow-bearing celestials slew Niobe's offspring to punish her pride. Grieving Niobe wept till she became an actual fountain. We see her dissolving into a dark pool on the path. We can make out her legs and some not very distinct body part dissolving into water at the angel's feet. Dante enumerates many further examples from biblical and classical history, but Brito illustrates the first few and leaves the rest suggested. Finally, we see the angel pointing the way up to the next level. In the following plate, we are on the plain of the envious. As the poets enter, they are unsure which direction to take. Dante is looking one way, while Virgil turns to face the sun and decides to move towards it, taking the sky's great light as his guide. Soon they come upon the envious. Their punishment is to have their eyes, which looked evilly at others' good, sewn shut. Thus Brito represents them all with closed eyes. Dante tells us, It seemed they were all dressed in sackcloth, woven from sharp, bristly horsehair, each one propping self up against his fellow, all of them leaning back against the wall. Thus blind people, 
in dire want will stand at the doors of a church on holy days, begging for their needs. They stand together, one resting his head on the other's shoulder, all the more effectively to place compassion in the passer-by, not only by their plaintive tones, but by their very posture, insistently sad. A detail which so delighted Brito that he repeated it in a series all round the mountain. Since Brito has not distinguished the figures of the envious, we need not enumerate the various persons Dante speaks with, but proceed to the next vignette, taken from the following canto. Dante's eyes are confronted by a great flash of light, which he first thinks is the descending sun reflected back up at him from a pool on the path. It turns out that the brightness comes from a particularly radiant angel who stands before them, pointing the way to the next level. Brito has made an error here. The figure who shades his face from the light is Dante. The V and the D for Virgil and Dante have been transposed. The stairs the angel directs them to are, as always, precipitous. The sun and the bright angel, carefully rendered here, are important as foreshadowing Virgil's discourse, which compares the shared joy of heaven to light multiplied by reflection, a hint of the ecstatic light symbolism we will find in Paradiso. The next plate concludes the treatment of Canto 15. The first two Dante-Virgil pairs on the lower level represent the course of their philosophical discussion, stressing again the importance of the light symbolism just mentioned. Next, we see the poet's entry into the dense smoke that defines the terrace of the angry. Canto 16 opens with the lines, Dark of hell, dark of night, when clouds deprive the sky of whatever little light the stars would have glimmered or planet granted in passing. Darker than these darks, that thick smoke curtain that covered our sight, ourselves, completely. Harsher, too, this coarse, substantial fog, whose stinging soot forbade an open eye. My wise and faithful guide drew closer to my side, offered me a shoulder to hold on to him by. I followed behind, led like one blind, gripping lest I lose him, trusting he'd avoid any sudden injurious obstacle and shun the fatal brink. Brito has admirably rendered the palpably dense fog. The angry Marco of Lombardy, who gives a canto-long discourse on free will, is a kind of animate acronym, just a head and legs protruding from the smoke under a letter M. The group proceeds single file for safety in their sightless walk along the narrow ledge. Marco keeps to the rear. At last, he says, You see that whiteness beginning to show through the smoke? The beams that bleach the blackness? That's the angel who guards the path of pardon leading up. I have to go. I'm not allowed to approach him until I've fully repented of my temper. As usual, at top right, the angel who guards the border directs the travelers to the steep steps leading to the next level. Mm -hmm.